Welcome to the study of God's Word, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Well, again, good evening. And even for those on the radio, good evening. We get to talk about some good stuff tonight. Some really good stuff. And if you came in feeling down, this is one of those messages that I could almost guarantee uh, you're going to go out feeling much better. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look at heaven. And uh, we're going to gain some hope from it tonight and be encouraged by it. Uh, as I was praying about you know, what I would teach tonight, uh, there was... You know, you, you go through, um, you know, what have I taught on recently? Or, um, oh, you know, what's the Lord stirring my heart, heart towards? And, uh, you know, so I was just praying, Lord, confirm for me what you want me to, to teach on. And it was on Sunday that I was reading in my devotions, my morning devotions became, before I came into the church, that uh, the Lord gave me this word. And so I wanted to share it with you tonight. But just confirm, you're supposed to teach on heaven. And it's Isaiah 26, 19. It says, but those who die in the Lord will live. Their bodies will rise again. Those who sleep in the earth will rise up and sing for joy. For your life-giving light will fall like dew on your people in the place of the dead. And so just that hope, even in the midst of like Isaiah, where you know, a lot of people think of Isaiah and think of judgment, 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 and God, you know, having to threaten his people, not threaten them, but, you know, he's, he's trying to, um, you know, he's having to discipline them, but, but yet there's so many of these words that he brings in there to bring hope. He's always uh, hope, and, um, and so he tells them of the future to come, and, uh, and it's supposed to, to be a joy to them. And so may it be a joy to us tonight. Let me even say this, that um, it was good for me to hear that and good for me to reflect on, on heaven because even that morning I got news of a, a man in our fellowship. His name is Jim Harla, who's gone here for many years. Uh, he died on Saturday night and it was very sudden. And um, to get news, uh, he was, you know, Sunday morning. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to be upset because I had these words on my mind and in my heart, and, and I just knew, Jim's, Jim's at rest. Man, he's, he's living out, and he has seen fulfilled that scripture right there. And I don't have to cry for him. Like, I can rejoice with him. Like, he has that now that crown of rejoicing uh, as he's in, you know, as he's there with the Lord. And so, um, I pray that as we come away, that we'll be encouraged by this tonight. How much time do you actually spend thinking about heaven? I mean, how much time do you really give to it? And if I was to ask you what heaven is like, what would your answer be? Uh, you know, I've had opportunity in teaching on this subject before to ask high school students and uh, middle school students and even adults, and you really get an array of different answers about it. Um, a lot of times you get really vague descriptions. Oh, it's supposed to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. Well, that sounds great, but I mean, that really doesn't really tell us so much. You know, and when we really start to think of it, well, I don't know what heaven's going to be like. Uh, we, we have this idea of what we see on TV is like, you know, there's going to be clouds and angels floating around, little baby angels with harps, and, you know, it'll look something like that. Um, but that's about it. Like, we we don't give much thought to it. Is that even something that we can look into? Is that even something that we can know about? You know, does the, the Bible even have, you know, enough description to give us an idea of what heaven's going to be like? Well, it does. It has a lot to tell us of what heaven is going to be like, a lot for us to look into. You know, one of the greatest misconceptions, I think, when it comes to heaven, and because we don't know a lot about it and we don't spend a lot of time imagining it, well, we get this idea that heaven's just going to be boring, that there's not much there to do because there's not much there to think about. But that's not true. 
Heaven's not going to be a boring place. It should be a place that we're excited for, a place that we're, uh, we want to go to, a place that we have great antici- anticipation for seeing one day. Heaven is a wonderful place. You know, I've heard it said that life is a ship traveling between birth and death, and along the way, we're free to move about on board as we wish, but we're not the captain. Um, but we get to move around. We get to, to live life, and, and, and we know that, you know that there's a destination out there for us, and we know that death isn't even the final destination. It's just the port that we enter into, and then we go beyond that to our final, final destination. And for the Christian, our final destination is heaven. And I'm not a person who goes on a lot of cruise ships, uh, but I know a lot of people who do, and it seems to me that the people who go on those cruise ships are always talking about that destination, where they're getting to. You know, that's where they want to be. You know, are you excited for heaven? Are you ready for it? And is it a place that you want to go to? Good, I'm glad for that. We should be excited for the things of heaven. But you know, in this day and age, it seems to me that we quickly move past death. We don't want to come near it. Uh, When it comes to like funerals and memorial services, and we do a lot of those here. And I see for many, they just move right past it. You're not supposed to deal with the sorrow. You're not supposed to deal with the grief. It hurts too bad. Let's just quickly move through it and get over it. We want to put uh, death to the side. And so we put heaven to the side. We're not thinking about the afterlife either. So, you know, uh, we start to think more about living for the here and now. And we get our eyes focused here and think that the pleasures of this life are going to be what satisfies us the most. But you know, if we fall in line with that thinking, then we'll lose sight of where we're headed and the result will be hopelessness. There should be a hope that we gain when we think of heaven one day and that the Lord has made a way for us to be there. And that Jesus even said that he's gone to prepare that place for us. Like, he would said that to, to people who were grieving already, that they were going to lose him, that he was going to prepare a place for them. That was good news to them. It should be good news to us even today. You know, and, and the things of this life, as we move around on this ship, and uh, there's lots of things that we can get involved in, and there's lots of pleasures uh, that, that we can take part in and get out of this life. But you know what? When we really think of heaven and we know the reality of it, We'll be like Paul who said to the Philippians as he weighed out in his mind, is it better to be here on earth or is it better to be there in heaven? And what did Paul say? He said, it is far better to be with Jesus. And that's where we want to be. That's where we want to be, far better to be there. Well, if it's far better to be there, what, what is there waiting for us? Well, we're going to look into that. We want that same mindset that Paul has. We want that to be our heart. And if that's not our heart tonight, why not? And, and can the Lord, you know, restore that to us or give that to us tonight? And that's my hope for us all. Tonight, I want to talk to you about heaven, uh, but I want you to know this is not a definitive study on it. Uh, in fact, I feel so, you know, um, I don't know what the word is, small, weak. Like, who am I to share with you about heaven? Um, you know, it's such a big topic, and it seems like the one that aged, wise men speak about. And so you can certainly go and find many teachings on this, it, and you can go to some great men. One of the books that I would have you look into, and it's one that I took a lot from for this study, is a book called Heaven by a man named Randy Alcorn. But there's other teachings you could go find on YouTube. You can find Greg Laurie taught a series on heaven. You can go find... Uh, if, if you're into John Piper or Billy Graham has some great stuff out there on heaven. Uh, Francis Chan has things on heaven. And so those are studies that you can go view. This is not that definitive study. This right here is a pep talk. This is to get you excited for the kingdom of God again. And this is something to whet your appetite so you're ready to feast on all of God's grace and his blessings for you. In fact, I think of the words of Christ. I I get to be, you know, I get to follow in my Savior's footsteps when I think of this because this is what Jesus proclaimed over himself as he began his ministry. 
It's Isaiah 61.1, and in the presence of many in the synagogue that day, he read these and said, they are fulfilled in your presence. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. So let's pray and we'll get into the study tonight. Father, we thank you for um, this time that we get to share in your word and uh, I And we get to get in and look at the things of heaven and spend some time meditating on that. And I pray that from it, um, there would be those here tonight who will receive comfort. And for those who need comforted, they will be set at peace and be given peace. And Lord, I pray that we would be inspired, that uh, those who feel like, like maybe, you know, they're stagnant right now in their faith, and uh, they haven't been moving forward. I pray this would be something that would just put a flame, you know, light that flame and fan that flame again in them. But um, they'd be on fire for you and excited for the kingdom of God and ready to share it. Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged and that we would grow in our faith from this uh, study here tonight. And um, we'd be excited for the things that you have in store for us And we thank you that you are a great, loving, and merciful God who would allow us a place with you in eternity. Who are we? But Lord, you are so good. You are so good to us. So as we look on your goodness tonight, may we be refreshed. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 21. And we're just going to look at uh, seven, eight verses, and this is going to be the basis for our study tonight. So Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. And you know, if we're going to be talking about heaven, then obviously the the question that uh, we've got to answer is, what will heaven be like? And so that's, that's where we're going with, what will heaven be like? What will it be like? What will heaven be like? Well, let's look at Revelation 21, and it has some things to tell us. It says in verse 1, and this is John writing down what he saw as he was privy to see these things. He said, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. These few verses, and even what follows into uh, the rest of chapter 21, and you go into chapter 22 as you finish out the book of Revelation, give us enough uh, to help us get a good idea of what heaven is like. And we can, we can even get a good idea just from the first verse that we saw there in chapter 21. As you look at verse 1, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And you can't get caught up on that word heaven. Uh, we've been, you might say, misusing that word. 
Here, when we look at heaven, uh, this is one of the three heavens that are described in Scripture. And so there's three heavens, and, uh, you know, whenever you do a word study in the Bible, you're going to find that there's multiple meanings to one word. Well, this one word has, can have multiple meanings. It could mean, first of all, as we would look at um, our habitation here, that there's the heavens above us, which is the sky and the atmosphere, you know, where the clouds are and the birds fly. Uh, but then you go off, you know, beyond that. And there is a second heavens. And what's the second heavens? But outer space where the stars and the planets are. And then there's the heaven that often we uh, you know, would refer to as the dwelling place of God. It's where his presence is. Well, when this says the new heaven, then what that's talking about is it's actually speaking about the sky above us. And that's, that's what it's talking about. And so we can't get caught up on the new heaven where we want to get caught up in to help us understand and get this idea of what heaven could be like and what we should look forward to is you got to look at the new earth. The new earth, that's our dwelling place. That's the place that we often think of as heaven. When we think of uh, heaven, quote unquote, that place where believers spend eternity with God, when we think of that heaven, then we're thinking of the new earth. Is it okay that we call it heaven? Sure, it's okay. Because ultimately, heaven's where God is going to be and God is going to be with us in eternity. And we have the promise of scripture. We have it right there in Revelation 22, 4. But here's the new earth. That gives us a lot to, to, to stir our imaginations and to start thinking about what heaven will be like. Just those two words, tell us so much. When you look at these two words, let's just start with the first word. The first word is what? New. Oh, who doesn't like the word new? Who doesn't like new things? I can tell you for me, for me in my life, me and my wife, uh, because of the way that we live and wanting to be in ministry and being careful with our money, and um, we don't always buy new. We buy used a lot of the time. And so when we get to get new, oh, how good it is to have something new. Because you know what makes new so good is that you don't get the problems that come with the used because it hasn't been worn out. And, it, you know, we think of new and uh, new has this great meaning of it's recently made, it's fresh, it's unused, it's unworn. New is so good. So you take that and you apply it to this word earth, which we're very familiar with because that happens to be where we're living right now is the earth, but we're going to have a new earth. So when we look at heaven, as we think about it, that dwelling place with God for all of eternity, it's going to be earth, only it's going to be new. The new earth. So it's a new earth. So when we think of it that way, then we can look around us. And if it's the earth, then essentially uh, it'll have the same components that we would see around us. In fact, we see it right here in these two chapters. We even saw a lot of it there in verse 21. There'll be a new heaven and atmosphere and there'll be a new earth. And that's talking about dirt and ground and land and space. So picture our world only without sin, as though it were brand new. Look around you. When you step out tonight and you go out into the world or you're looking around tomorrow during the day, you can look around and you're gonna see around you this present earth bursting with suggestions of what the new earth will be like. And, and it has this description throughout scripture. You go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. How does it describe heaven there? It describes it in earthly terms. It'll be a country and it will be a city. It'll be a heavenly country, it says. So it'll be a place of dwelling of God. It'll be that better place desired by the people of faith. And so this better country will have, according to these words right here, uh, and, and so on into chapter 22. I mean, if it's gonna have a new heaven, that means we can look forward to blue skies, a new atmosphere, 
So I expect it would be blue. Maybe it would be a different color, but it's going to be new. It's going to be good. We don't have to worry about it falling down on us anymore. The, the whole worry about global warming is not going to be in play. We don't have to worry about that. We'll have a brand new sky. And, and from the descriptions going on here, there's going to be mountains, there's going to be rivers, there's going to be trees, there's going to be fruit, which would suggest that there's plants of all kinds, grasses, bushes, flowers, and, and maybe even, but I can't promise, that there'll be animals there. And isn't that one of our great questions about heaven? Will my pets go to heaven? We get that question all the time on the radio, and... Um, I'm so glad I don't do the radio anymore because that was the stumper right there. How do you tell someone? Anyways, so could there be animals? Sure. Isaiah 35, as I was reading it in my, you know, but I don't know what that's going to look like. Will your animal be there? I can't say. But I was reading Isaiah 35 today, and even as I was in my devotion, just this picture of how gorgeous it's going to be and beautiful. I don't know about you, but I'm someone who more recently has been trying to get out into nature. I've been, man, we live in a beautiful place, Colorado, don't we? Yes. And if you notice in the scripture, we saw there that it says that there's going to be no sea. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because seas divide. Um, but there's going to be mountains. And for all you Californians, I'm sorry that California is not as heaven-like as you would think it would be. But I think you should take John Denver's words into account because I think he had it right when he said the closest place to heaven on this planet anywhere is to be in Colorado. And so, <laughs> there'll be no sea, but there'll be water, there'll be rivers. In fact, there'll be that river that flows, you know, through the city and it, it speaks of God's grace and we'll drink from it and we'll be refreshed and we'll have life forevermore. There will be cities with streets and buildings. So even beyond the natural that we would look at, the dirt and the grass and the flowers and the plants, you know, we could look at even outside and see the bustling city around us. And that, that speaks of what heaven's going to be like because there's going to be a city. It's going to be like a city. In fact, the big city there is going to be the new Jerusalem that comes down. That's what the rest of chapter 21 talks about is the new Jerusalem and the glory of it. And so uh, that would suggest if you have a city that you have buildings and you have houses and you have uh, places of commerce, uh, places where families and friends live together in unity, and when you start to think of heaven in that way of being that country and that city, these are places that, that, we, that we're going to be a part of and interact with. And, and many places where, where we can explore and we can be challenged. I heard a, a, a junior high kid when I was telling them this, like, I don't think it's gonna be boring. Now, what challenge will there be for me? What are you kidding? There'll be plenty of challenge because there'll still be work for us to do. Remember when God put Adam and Eve in the garden? What is the first thing he gave Adam to do? Was he put him to work and it was challenging, but it wasn't that challenging like, like this is hard and difficult, oh, I hate this. You know, Adam didn't walk around like that, but the challenge that he had, it was so challenging by the way, he had to get a what? A helpmate, right? He had to get a helpmate. So it was challenging, but it was so rewarding. It's so good. Like, you know how it is when you have that great work day where you've accomplished so much, and you're like, that was good. It was challenging. That was good. That's how it will be, I think, in heaven. We can build and create. I mean, because those are the things that God instilled to us because those are a part of who he is. And he's not gonna steal those away from us now because they will forever be who he is. And so they'll be forever a part of who we are to create and build, to engage in work and play, to fellowship. And all of this will be done as part of our worship to the Lord, just like it was in the days of Adam and Eve. It will be an adventure. And I want you to know, and especially for the high schoolers and junior high kids in here, it will not be boring. It won't be boring. It'll be exciting. It'll be fun. Oh, and that gives me so much joy to think about. 
We will be filled with fascination and excitement, pleasure that is pure and fresh and simple and good. But if, if that worries some of you folks who move a little bit slower and you're going, oh, that sounds like too much, uh, that's all right, because we'll still be there and we'll, we'll have rest and contentment, joy forevermore. There'll be peace, peace. You know, in all this, of course, there'll be people. There'll be people all around us. And so we get to experience, you know, this physical landscape of the, you know, the, the earth and, you know, the new Jerusalem. But in that is going to be people. And we're going to still continue to experience relationships with people. What will people be like? Well, first of all, we're promised that we're going to have new bodies will be like Jesus. Remember when he came in his glorified body um, to see the disciples. And you know what's interesting? One of the things that Jesus did with the disciples and even in his Christophany with Abraham, I was just reading this the other night with my kids right before, uh, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. What does Jesus in this Christophany do with Abraham? He eats with him. And so they'll be eating. In fact, we'll, we'll be able to eat from the tree of life which will be there for us to partake in. And so we'll still have these physical bodies, these physical bodies. This figure, and so we'll have still interaction in that way. You know, people help shape who we are here. So what will relationships be like there? Well, we'll still know our loved ones, certainly. And only the thing is, is that we'll get to know them better than ever. Better than ever. Will we have our enemies there? Because let's face it, you know, there's some people in the church we don't get along with so well. But will they be there? Sure. Will any of that junk matter? No. And we'll have fellowship and it'll be good. Big question that was asked, and I was surprised that high schoolers asked this question when I was teaching on heaven. Will there be marriage? Yes and no. Yes, because we see even, again, in these chapters, if you were to continue on, but even we got a piece of it there in the verses we read, that Jesus is our groom and we, the church, are his bride. So, yeah, marriage, because we're going to be married to Jesus, right, in perfect union with him. But Jesus had said that the institution of marriage wasn't going to be needed among people anymore. And... Uh, you know, that might frighten you, but, you know, we're still going to belong to one another. We're still going to have deep relationships. None of those are going to go away. So husband and wife, those will still be, I believe, the first relationships that you have there. You know, you're not expected once you get to, to the new earth that you're going to know everybody. You can't know everybody because you're not omniscient. You know, you're not ever present everywhere. That's God. So that's part of eternity is we're going to be getting to know people, but are, who are you going to be with first? The people you already know. And who's the person you know best? Jesus. But, but in that personhood, in the human, who do we know? Yeah, our spouse. And so that's who we're going to get to know. They'll be, you know, we'll, we'll belong to Jesus. We'll still belong to one another in perfect unity. But deep relationships won't end. They'll grow and they'll get deeper. Peter Kreeft, he writes this, and I love to think of this. There are only six things, he says, that never get boring on earth. Six things that never come to an end. Knowing and loving yourself, knowing and loving your neighbor, and knowing and loving God. Since persons are subjects and not objects, they are not exhaustible. They are like magic cows that give fresh milk forever. The two great commandments that are our job description for life here in both this world and the next, express this plan. We must love God wholly and we must love our neighbor as ourself. And in order to love, we must know, get to know as endlessly as we love endlessly. This never gets boring even on earth. Getting to know and love more and more someone we already know and love, it is our clue and our preparation for our eternal destiny of infinite fascination. In other words, one of the things that we're going to get to explore is the people around us. And, and people are exciting when you get to know them. The more you explore them, um, the, uh, I mean, how much more joy 
do we receive from that? You're going to have eternity to get to know people. And your, your best friend, your, um, your wife, your husband, uh, spending eternity getting to know them. But that's something you should already be doing here. You know, isn't that true in this life? I meet people who are like, we've been married 50 years. You know, my, I think my parents might be that way. Uh, you know, we've been married 50 years and you don't know that I like chocolate ice cream. You know, like there's just some things that we don't, we can't know. But we're going to know. Well, we have all these great things in heaven to look forward to. Uh, of ex, you know, the new earth and the new Jerusalem and these relationships that we're going to get to have with people and new bodies to enjoy it. But you know what's exciting too? Is all the things that aren't going to be there. So what will heaven be like without sin? Well, the book Heaven has a great list, and I've added to it a little bit. Just think about this. There will be no death or pain or suffering. So there'll be no need for funeral homes, abortion clinics, or psychiatric wards. There'll be no rape, missing children, or drug rehab centers. No bigotry, burglary, or killings. No worry, or depression, or fear. No wars, no hurricanes, or earthquakes, or tsunamis, or the like. There'll be no unemployment. No misunderstandings or conflicts between people. There'll be no con men trying to rip off your identity and take all your money. There'll be no locks on the doors, no gates, to keep people out, no handicaps, no cancer, no AIDS, or even colds or flu. There'll be no arthritis even. I threw that one in for my mom. No taxes, no bills, no computer crashes, no traffic jams and accidents, and there'll be no boredom. We'll have close relationships, but no clicks. Laughter, but no put downs. Any of our jokes won't be at other people's expense. Intimacy, but no temptation to immorality. No hidden agendas, no betrayals. Imagine mealtime, mealtime gathered together, and nobody has to rush off to do anything. We have eternity to enjoy one another. We'll spend that time telling stories and we'll share in laughter and joy. And we can do it all without a fear of insensitivity, inappropriate behavior, anger, gossip, lust, jealousy, hurt feelings, arguments, or anything that eclipses joy. That's heaven. You know what else won't be there? Surprisingly, is there'll be no temples there'll be no church. And you know why? Because we don't need to go to a place to be drawn into the presence of God because we will have his presence always. Always in his presence. So, you know, those are great things that we've talked about, but the best part is this, and it's the real beauty of heaven, is God dwelling with man. We get to be with God and he comes down to share in life with us and give us life. And God dwelling with man is the central goal of the redemption plan of God. And there it will be fulfilled. God dwelling with man. The Bible begins and it ends with God dwelling with man. Being with us and us with him. We will be with God and we will see God uh, just like it says there in Revelation 22, 4, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. We will be his, we will belong to him. What security and joy there is in that. What strength we have in that. What hope. I like how Randy Alcorn said it. He said, to look into God's eyes will be to see what we've always longed to see the person who made us and for whom we were made. And we will see him in the place he made for us and for which we were made. Seeing God will be like seeing everything else for the first time. We will discover that seeing God is our greatest joy and life itself. 
Every other joy of heaven will be derivative, flowing from the fountain of our relationship with God. Beholding and knowing God, we will see ourselves and all other people and events through God's eyes. We will spend eternity worshiping, exploring, and serving our great God. We will see his breathtaking beauty in everything and everyone around us. And that brings me great joy, and I pray it does you too. Go to see God, to know him and to be known by him. I don't know about you, but I I feel so misunderstood in this world. I can't say enough words to help people to understand where I'm coming from or who I am or uh, you know, bring across the message that I'm trying to deliver to them, to try to give them. I mean, it's just so hard, isn't it, to get understanding? I mean, how many times in the middle of your fights, husbands and wives, or you who have friends and have ever you know, had conflict with you, you just don't understand me. We've said that. But you know, in, in the face of God, we'll have... Oh, to be known. What was it like? I think of Nathaniel. Remember when he met Jesus for the first time in John chapter 1? And uh, Jesus said, ah, oh, what did he say? Something like, that. you're a man of strong faith, you know? And he said, how do you know me? Well, I saw you under the fig tree. Whoa. You know, like what Jesus was saying is, I've known you. I know you. Man, to be known by God. And then all the questions that I have about God. And to know him. What joy, what pleasure we'll have in that. You know, if heaven is a reality to us now, well, how will it change the way we live now? I know the effects that it has on me. Because the more that I think of heaven, I see the world as it really is. And uh, I'm, I'm losing my love for it. Because there's something better for me. You know, when, it, when I think of heaven, it, it helps to bring sin into right perspective. I mean, when I read through that list of there will not be this or this or this or this in heaven, you know, the one that sticks out to me is abortion, abortion clinics. We know none of that. None of that. How evil is that in our world? And many call that evil good. And we're so confused about that. And it can be confusing even for us Christians because we have this heart to want to help people and we see people in need and we see them hurting or suffering or having to struggle. And so something like abortion, well, you know, who wouldn't? I mean, to make life easier for someone. But it's evil. We don't even have to wrestle with that question. It's, it's, we just see it as evil. It is what it is. It's sin. Bring sin into right perspective. Because you know, all the other things of sin in my life, they won't be there either. Praise God. Praise God, because we'll be set free from those things. Whatever it may be, the sexual immorality, the anger, the violence, I don't know what it may be for, for you. I'm not saying those are me, but, but we all have to deal with them. They won't be there. You know, it increases my thanksgiving and increases my praise. Oh, praise God. How merciful he is. Oh, it really shows how gracious and merciful he is that he would allow me to be there with him one day. It gives me a new excitement for life and even a new excitement for death. And I'm, you know, doesn't it give you that like, I'm ready. I'm ready right now. You know. Oh, so much to look forward to. Like a kid, like, you know, uh, my son Jeremiah sitting back there and... um, Man, that kid, if you get him excited about something, like his birthday last week, he's got to ask you every day for a hundred days prior to his birthday, when's it going to come? 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 When's it, when is it, it when? And um, 
you know, I don't know if you have Alexa in your home. We have Alexa, and so thank goodness she can answer those questions. How many days until Jeremiah's birthday? But he gets so excited. Lord, how many days? When will you come? When will it happen? I'm ready. It gives me comfort, and it should give us comfort. I think of uh, the scriptures that, that were given. You know, this is how Jesus comforted his disciples and the apostles in turn, you know, comforted the persecuted church that they were ministering to as they spoke to them of heaven and comforted them. Again, that right perspective where Paul could say in his writings to the church in Corinth in chapter four, where he says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. What a great comfort. You know, when I think of heaven, and, and um, I, I think I, I, you know, one of the reasons why we started a study on heaven for the high schoolers is because we're going through Paul's letters. And Paul, when you read 2 Timothy, that's his deathbed letter. He is writing that knowing he is going to die soon, but he has this great outlook because he's looking ahead to heaven as he finishes out that letter. And he's not like in despair. He's not ready to give up. He has this determination to finish well. And he's even pressing Timothy. Timothy, you finish well as, as well. And so, man, it should, as we determine to finish well this life that the Lord has given to us, I want to run with purpose in every step. I think of the words of Paul. He said, don't you realize in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. purpose in every step. When I think of heaven, it gives me a new zeal to share Christ and invite others into God's kingdom. Man, look at all that the Lord has for me. It's not just for me. Oh, there's plenty of room in the new earth for whoever will say, I want to go and will come. If we invite them to come with us. You know, it helps me when I think of heaven not to put too much value on the things of this earth. They just don't seem to matter anymore. There's something better for me. Why am I going to spend my time worrying about the things here? It just passes away. And you know, the more I think about heaven, the less fear I have. Because what do I have to fear? This is what it did, again, for the apostles and for the persecuted church that they ministered to is throughout the New Testament. It would bring hope to think of the things of heaven and the days of Christ. So look to heaven. And I'd encourage you to do that because what are you facing that doesn't seem better or brighter after thinking about heaven? You feel like giving up? Look at heaven. You know, life is hard right now? Look at heaven. You lost someone? and you're hurting, look at heaven. There's something that's out there waiting for us. It's beautiful. Whatever it may be, look to heaven. And as you look there, who are you going to see? Because there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. So as you look to heaven, you can't help but look to Jesus as you look there. As you look there, you'll find hope. You know, verse 7 in 21 says here, 
Who is it that inherits all these things? It's he who overcomes. So heaven, the new earth, is for anyone who overcomes. And what that means is this. Those who are victorious receive heaven. So all who are victorious will inherit these blessings that we talked about here tonight. So how do we be victorious? Well, our victory is in Jesus Christ who showed by his resurrection that he has victory over sin and over death. And he leads us in this life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58 is where we'll finish. And it says this, what am I saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will take upon us the crown of victory, the crown of righteousness, the crown of blessing, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life that's ours. And it's for anyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ. You know, these are good things to look to. You know, when we, sometimes I feel like I'm, I've got to be careful with high school students that I'm not telling them, come to Jesus so you can have a good life now. There's a life that he's prepared for us and has prepared us for. I want them to look ahead to that. That's, what that victory that Christ has had over sin and death, that's the reward that is ours. And we look ahead to it with joy and anticipation and with hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight and the things of heaven that we can look upon and find hope. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here tonight who does not have the assurance that they will receive the reward. Lord, they'll come to Jesus Christ tonight, calling upon his name, that he may crown them with the crown of life. Lord, that they would know that victory over sin and death. That they'd be ready for that eternal kingdom that you have in store for all those who will come to you in Jesus Christ. So Lord, help them to make that decision tonight, to call upon you even now, putting faith in Jesus that all the work he's done, dying on the cross and rising again, has made everything right that we can dwell in your presence for all of eternity. Lord, help them to come tonight. And Lord, give the believers here tonight refreshed hope and new vigor to follow Christ and to follow him as though he were here right with us. Where would he lead us to? That we would proclaim the good news Lord, may we be willing to go. Make us willing. Give us a new excitement and joy for it. And I ask that in Jesus' name, amen.